Welcome to Rex and Rex, where we give our recommendations, explore your recommendations, watch fun wreckages, and also follow wherever our whims may lead us. I am Sith Scott. And I am Mistress Grey. Today, we will be talking about Winx Club, the cartoon version, and the live action one. Which you may have already guessed after you clicked on this video, and if you haven't guessed why you clicked on this video, then I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you should look at the videos you click on before you start looking at them. Anyways, after this quick intro, we'll take a quick look at the two animated English dubs, and then the live action one, and do a fun episode comparison. Timestamps should appear on the screen somewhere. Not quite sure yet, but they'll be there. This episode comparison won't be entirely fair and objective. I grew up watching Wings Club, and I can't just erase my knowledge of where the cartoon goes and my warm, nostalgic feelings towards it. We'll try our best to give the new show a fair shot in this first episode comparison, but I make no promises. And before we get started, I want to go over the reaction people had to the live action material and why they may have had that. All right. So many people are raging on, on the new live-action Netflix version before it even comes out, but I think they have a pretty good reason to do so. People love the animated version having all these different kinds of fashion. The live-action version decides to have bland outfits in all its promotional materials and clips. People love the diversity of the show. The Netflix version decides to whitewash and remove characters. People love the mix of sci-fi and fantasy. The Netflix adaptation has promotional material that makes it seem like it's an urban fantasy. I could go on and on. However, I think all these are fair points of why people are already apprehensive. But I still wanted to see how the original stood up over the test of time and how the new one compared. Like I said, I used to watch Winx Club as a kid, but I also realized that only a handful of shows that I used to watch still hold up. And I have mixed feelings taking on lighthearted properties or kids shows and making them quote unquote mature. I mean, as a kid I ate up fan content that took material I loved in a darker or unexplored direction. I read grim tales from down below for Pete's sake. If you don't know what that is, please don't look it up. I'm in a little embarrassed that I read that. But, and while I'm more critical of grim, dark, and edgy work now, I do still explore, enjoy exploring darkness on occasion. There are also characters that I and many others enjoy that have been reimagined in both dark and lighter ways, often to great success, such as Batman. So I don't think a dark take on Winx Club is something I would automatically hate. But I'll admit, uh, there are plenty of other fair reasons for why people reacted so, so negatively to darker takes or live action adaptations of stuff they like. Uh, this one reason I think people have for disliking such takes is that m while many fans want more content, they're also kind of protective of the stuff they like. It doesn't help that this protectiveness has been validated by the, all the grim and gritty or live action remakes that don't take the time to understand what the fans like about the property in the first place. Like how I mentioned in all the promotional material for Winx Club's live action adaptation, they didn't sh they dropped a lot of elements that people loved. Heck, take a look at Dragon Ball Evolution for another example of uh, an adaptation that didn't understand the appeal of the source material. And I think another reason people uh, uh, have such negative reactions is that they want the stuff they like to be respected. And often live action adaptations don't do that, especially with properties that are animated because, at least in America, animation is still considered kid stuff, even though animation is a medium and not a genre. Heck, even stuff aimed at kids can be worth respecting and not shameful to enjoy. So, I mean, so long as adults don't suddenly start demanding it cater to them instead of their intended audience. Babe, babe, babe I love you, but uh, I'm already done with my dance. You may not have noticed it, but I was dancing in the background and...
I finish it. I saw all the dance moves. Anyways, um, I think we should probably get this train back on track. Fine. Fine. My last point is that I, I think people's reaction also has to do with the range and longevity and size of a property and how they react to it. Like, take Batman. He's been around for about 82 years and has been interpreted in a wide variety of ways already. So, while people might bemoan an adaptation they don't like, or, or a bad adaptation, it isn't going to ruin the character forever, nor will it be too long before there's another take they do enjoy. When something does b ha bad does happen, it, even if it could theoretically be bad enough to ruin the character, it's going to have a very different reaction if it's just a one-shot comic versus a blockbuster movie. With the, net, with the Winx Club, I'm not sure how a bad live-action adaptation could theoretically impact the franchise. I mean, it's been around for 18, what, 18 years? And it's had so many seasons that even Yu-Gi-Oh! is a bit jealous. And it was also popular enough to have a theme park, so I'm not sure how much impact the Netflix series could have on the franchise as a whole. Alright, alright, I'm done, I'm done, your turn. Okay, I don't have too much to add upon to what was already, you know, added on to with what was said. Honestly, I've only casually watched the old Winx Club back when I was a kid because I mainly just waited for TMNT to come on and it was on before it. So, in case you want more of a fresh take on which one I like based on this kind of preference, we'll be I'll be able to analyze this series for the first time, I guess more analytically, because... Back then, watching Wings Club, it was just, hey, look, all the pretty light shows and stuff. Because as a kid, you don't really care too much about story or, you know, character. Unless the character looks cool. So, yeah. This will be my first time analyzing it through an analytical theme point. So, this will be fun. Okay, we'll be starting with the Four Kids dub. Because I think that's the first dub that came out. And it's what I'm more familiar with. Alright, Four Kids gets a lot of... Rightful flack. These donuts are great. Jelly filled are my favorite. Nothing beats a jelly filled donut. But they had a lot of great theme songs. I mean, I honestly really like a lot of them. And fight me if you think otherwise. I am tiny but mighty. I will fight you. Fight, fight, fight me. Okay, okay. Like this song is no exception to. Uh, being one of the great uh, four kids theme songs. It's just a complete bop. I also really appreciate the intro because uh, it shows off the characters without explicitly stating who they are. Though I'll admit, the theme song does feel a little bit shallow. It's not a big deal, but it it just come off as a bit cringe. I also appreciate the song enhancing the whole "You Too Can Be Magic" part of the show. Even if it wasn't intentional, though I totally bet it was, it would still be a part of the show, as it starts off with a normal girl finding out she's magic and having a cast that's diverse in both personality and ethnicity, which lets a range of kids relate to the characters, you know? And it's kind of cute to invite kids to imagine that they can also join a magical club and be magic. It's also a bit cynical, and clearly trying to get that money from the kids' parents. But let's focus on the cute part. The, uh, visuals of the opening aren't that great. They're a they feel kind of like an AMV, as they are just matching clips from the show with uh, the song lyrics. But sometimes the clips and the song lyrics really match up in fun ways and have an emotional impact. Keep on searching far and wide for the fire burning deep inside. Though there is this one weirdly... And inexplicably 
detailed shot in the opening. Like, I just... Why is this suddenly have much more detailed shading than the rest of the shots? What does he deserve this for? Uh, well, I think that's about all I have to say about the four kids opening. Your turn, babe. My thoughts on this opening are... Honestly, it's like most four kids opening. If there's one thing they can do right, it's opening songs. Everything that they do just makes you want to dance around or do something fun. Or, you know, do epic stances. That works out, too. Uh, even if you don't necessarily like the way that four kids does their edits and their cuts, their openings are always probably the prime of all their shows. So, I'm going to give a bit of a recap of what you can see through the Four Kids episode. <clears throat> we start off with this normal, average, everyday high school teenager named Bloom deciding to go to the park. You know, most people do that on their off days or whatever. She then sees a fairy, who is named Stella, and she is being attacked by what appears to be an ogre. Bloom decides that this is not your everyday occurrence and wants to try to help save the fairy. So, Bloom does that somehow, being able to hurt the ogre with whatever power she just apparently musters through, I don't know, the power of will. Bloom then takes this fairy home, and then wakes up the next day, because that's apparently how that works, to her mother asking who the heck is in their guest room. And by guest room, she just means the living room, because she's just sleeping on the couch the whole time. Bloom then does some chores and then talks to a caddy girl. We get to see the ogre meeting his bosses and then being sent out to go find the fairy again because he didn't catch her the first time. Bloom then comes home for a big exposition jump from the fairy named Stella about fairies and then it now explains that Bloom has magic, which explains her willpower magic thing. Stella then go quickly shows Bloom the magic school, you know, to help her see what she has in store for her if she wants to learn the magic. And then when they come back, the ogre comes back with them, trying to attack the house. Bloom and Stella fight them, and they don't do the best job, but Stella then invites some heroes in training to help, which do help out a lot. And then we, you know, do another cut to the next day, where Stella gets to take Bloom and her parents to the fairy school of Alfea. Since, you know, Bloom has magic now. Which, as we have stated, magic is something that needs some practice because you can't just use it through willpower, except for when you need to. Now we're going to go over some of the things that we noticed about this version. I kind of want to do most of the things that I want to say in more of a comparison between the two, of the, actually, more of the animation ones. And we can do that a little bit later. But I do want to say one thing, is that Yugi Moto's in this as the future prince. And that's just awesome to me. At least that's what Mistress Grey tells me. If she lies to me, it's on her head. <clears throat> okay, then. Thanks for that. Okay, one thing I noticed is that the voice acting is not too great. They sound a bit cheap and cheesy, if I'm being honest. Don't you talk about my man Dan Green like that. Yes, yes, there are some standout voice actors in this. But back to what I was saying. The voices and the dialogue are a bit cheesy. Let's call your parents now, shall we? I'm afraid that's like so way easier said than done. This can result in some great lines. Forget that. I got this puppy wrapped up all by myself. Dude, one summer at a swashbuckler camp doesn't mean you can go solo on a troll. <laughs> I rest my case. And some bad lines. Good thing you aced how to battle forest creatures, Timmy. Cool alert. And overall, it kind of feels like an abridged series. I mean, it doesn't go quite as bonkers as some abridged series. And isn't as good as, what was that anime? Is dub Ghost Tales or whatever? Though another thing I do appreciate about both the dialogue and the voice actors is even if it's cheap and cheesy, it there's a real attempt to make the characters feel distinct from each other. Like, listen to these clips. 
You know, that used to be your favorite book. You used to pretend you were a fairy. You could do it for hours. Well, see you later, Mitzi. If I do have powers, Kiko, remind me to turn her into a monkey. Hey, cool room, Bloom. Wow. You should totally bring it to Althea. A quick packing spell and it'll fit in a handbag. Both the lines and the way the characters are played could not be easily switched. And I just appreciate that. It's, it could have been just so easy just to read it out and turn in a paycheck. But there was a real attempt. Another thing I want to highlight is this It's just such a good reuse of the music and really heightens the emotion of the moment. It's basically the moment where Bloom is turn find discovering her magic powers for the first time and it's just really good reuse of the song. Yeah, it's just cute and cheesy and great. My childhood, everyone. Wait, did you just change outfits? Yes. Yes, I did. Why? Because fashion is important to this show. And I look gosh darn cute, don't I? Are you saying it has to be based on your outfit if you look cute or not? <laughs> I am naturally cute, thank you very much. So you didn't need to change the outfit. It fits with the things. Okay. Now, let's move on to the Nick Dub. The opening fits well enough, but it's kind of boring. Like the Four Kids Dub, it also uses clips from the show in its opening, but it has these cheap looking effects that I don't think have aged very well. I mean, compared to most anime openings we see. Pretty much all American cartoon openings look a bit cheap. <laughs> well, actually, I looked it up. This is the same as the Italian opening, just in English. I mean, I can't say that the lyrics are the same since I don't speak Italian. And But I assume it's the same since A, it's originally from Ital Italy, and the beat's the same, so I assume the lyrics are pretty close. I stand by what I said. Fine, fine. But Western animated openings are getting better. I mean, have you seen uh, Owl House? That is some great animation. And heck, even the four, uh, even the Wings Club openings get better over time. Or at least I think so. But you're free to disagree. Okay, back to the Nick opening, or the Italian opening, or whatever. This fo first opening kind of feels like an early fan AMV. The, and it would have been amazing if it was a fan AMV. But as a professional work, it kind of falls flat and feels a bit cheap, you know? Though it is more technically impressive than the four kids one. But it doesn't have the same lyrical and visual pairings. Side note, I'm pretty sure I recognize some of the images used in this opening from stuff like posters and digital backgrounds and other materials used to promote the show when it first aired. I don't know if, if it's sad that I recognize all this stuff or not, but whatever. I mean, considering how much you love the show, apparently, that shouldn't be too surprising. If I saw Dragon Ball Z backgrounds, it'd probably be the same thing. Okay, okay. And after listening to the song a few times, I've kind of come to enjoy it. Even if it's a bit hard for me to understand some of the times. Maybe I don't have that great of an ear. With the magic ray, the sky is all blazing. An adventure is certain to start. 
And it's much more chill than the Four Kids song. And I still think it fits the show as it focuses on friendship and how much fun it is to hang out with these characters. The Four Kids focus more on the fun but in a more hype way. And it also had a lot more emphasis on fashion and action. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pull the reins. We're doing the comparisons later. Again. Fine, fine, fine. Silly baby. All right, then, Sis Scott, what do you think of the openings? I just want to talk about the Nick one that we're going over. But, honestly, I wasn't the biggest keen on this one. It felt kind of either generic or bland to me. Like, almost like I've seen something like this a hundred times, which, honestly, I probably have. Eh, I mean, we all like our own things. Okay, you want to give another plot recap? Love to, though it's pretty similar to what the 4Kids dub was like. Um, however, when we look at the Nickelodeon one, we get to start off with Bloom actually waking up, going to interact with her parents. Then she leaves and interacts with the Caddy Girl, as we see from before. She sees Stella fight the ogre, decides to help her, then takes Stella home. And after that, it's pretty much the same story. The pacing, though, on this is a bit slower, but because of that, the story progression is a lot more cohesive and it's a little more lin linear. Well, that was a nice recap. Good job, baby. Okay, I'm going to talk about the voice acting now. The voice acting and dialogue is not that great. <laughs> Come here, I'll smash you like a china doll! Uh, oh no! The dialogue doesn't make the character stand out. So, this is your room, huh? Wow! Did you draw these? Yes! They're amazing! Sorry, I'm a bit nosy. Oh no, it's okay, Stella. I mean, huh? No, things are not okay. For instance, I still don't understand what happened in the park. And it feels a little exposition-y at times. Where is Althea? It's in the enchanted realm of magics. A place oh. beyond time and space where mm. everything is possible. I mean, to some extent, that makes sense. Since it is episode one, you gotta have some exposition. Or at least, in theory, you ought to have some ex exposition in episode one. But that's not the be-all, end-all rule. It's just, overall, the episode dialogue and the voice acting just feels boring. I'm sure the dialogue is closer to the original Italian considering that the opening was literally the same and the clips were actually in the right order. But that doesn't automatically mean it translates well or is good. Overall, it's not the worst dub ever, but it doesn't really stand out for me. Okay, your turn, babe, to talk about whatever you want to talk about and the dialogue. And the dialogue. Oh, I have something else other than the dub we're talking about. I just want to add on um, something that kind of emphasizes the what Mr. Scray was already talking about here. But the dialogue doesn't just not stand up, but the voices don't either. They almost feel like you could have had the same voices for almost any of these other characters, and it wouldn't have really changed who they were. Oh, you just kept the dialogue and have the voice of Stella, voice for Bloom, and it would have been the same exact thing. We wouldn't have really cared, or we wouldn't have noticed. They seem really similar. And it's not necessarily always a bad thing, but in this case, when you're trying to differentiate in the beginning of a story, it kind of is. Before we go over the Winx Club done by Netflix... You're going on another tangent? Also, wait, did you just change outfits again? Yes, I'm glad you noticed, baby. Just as long as we're clear on that. Alright, as I was saying, before we go over the Netflix Winx Club, uh, excuse me, Fate the Winx Saga, I want to make one thing clear. I said earlier that people have reasons for being protective of the properties they love, and that's true. But no matter what reaction we have to the Netflix adaptation, 
We do not promote fan entitlement or toxicity. We especially do not promote harassment of the people who involved in this project. I mean, complain, criticize, and whine, and make TikToks making fun of the show to your heart's content. But don't harass people, please. We good? We good. Great. All right, let's do that plot recap. Wait, before we give any of the spoilers in the plot recap, we should probably do a spoiler-free review for this one. Why? We didn't do that for the cartoon. Well, to be fair, the cartoon's been out for about, I don't know, 18 years or so? This just literally came out, like, now. Fine, fine. If you're highly attached to the cartoon, this is probably not going to appeal to you. It's not that great of an adaptation. I mean, it has enough similarities to the cartoon that you can see it, but if you didn't know about the cartoon, you'd probably think it was based on a YA novel. It, it really feels very YA or Riverdale-esque with terms like the burn one and the way characters act and how the setup is. <sighs> it walks the line of being too try-hard and too edgy and being competent. In later episodes, it could go off the rails or become a better show. I don't know. Also, without the cartoon, I don't know how many people would care about this. Like, it's fine, but I'm not sure how much buzz there would be around it just on its own. <clears throat> Adding on to that, um, as someone who did not see the cartoon... I think it's a pretty fine adaptation in the sense of it being its own thing. I don't think it really is really necessary for understanding anything, because it seems like they change a lot of the lore and stuff that it kind of is its own property, really. So, if you like the Winx and you want something that's exactly the same, or at least has the same kind of feel, this is not it. If you just want to watch something new and you don't want to have to deal with five seasons worth of animations and stuff to catch up on, then fine. You have perfect, some good, perfectly fine episodes you can watch. But it's nothing very extravagant, in my opinion. Also, there's no opening. Just a logo. Lame. We're really forgetting the art of openings, aren't we? Yeah, tell that to anime. <clears throat> Anyways, I guess it just makes more time for this 50-minute-long uh, episode show. Okay. Meh. Uh, okay, I do like the logo, though. It invokes the original with the wing shape and the colors while also being its own thing. It also looks like an X because, you know, winks. It has an X in the name. Ooh -hoo -hoo. But I hate the name. I mean, Fate the Winx Saga? It should be Winx the Fate Saga. What, are you afraid of the name Winx? If so, why did you adapt the Winx Club? Eh, <sighs> okay, okay. Recap time for real. You know, I was just thinking about it. I wonder if they have some kind of copyright thing with Winx Club. Anyways, that's not imp as important as the recap. Now, anyone who uh, wants to be spoilery free from all this, probably want to skip to any time frame we put on the screen. Otherwise, let's get down to the nitty-gritty of at least the first episode. We start off this first episode where we get to see a guy who is a, looks like to be a shepherd of some kind, or at least he's someone who's like a sheep herder. He crosses this barrier, looks like a magical barrier, and then he's dead. Or the sheep is dead, but yeah, he's pretty much going to shortly follow. Then we get to meet up with Bloom, the protagonist from the Winx Club, who is starting her time at Alfea. Kind of just skipped everything, but okay. And then meets Sky, who turns out to be some kind of jerk. Hooray. Then she actually meets Stella, and she's actually a bit of a jerk. Yay. Ugh. Looks like there's a bit of a theme with all these character adaptations. Everyone seems like they're some kind of teenage jerks for the sake of being teenage jerks. Anyways, she goes to talk with the headmistress, Dowling, who then talks with... Uh... Afterwards, um, Dowling lets her know a little bit about something about how she could just be magic with her, fa with her, um, someone in her previous ancestry could have been a fairy or someone with magic. 
She then talks with her parents in her dorm room, where we get to see a little bit of her roommate, and she kind of gets herself into a weird uh, position where she didn't tell her parents that she was actually going to a magical academy. And they believe that she's in Switzerland in the Alps. Because that's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Luckily, we get to meet her roommates shortly after that because one of her roommates, Aisha, helps her a lot with basically saying it's time to go. <laughs> we meet Tara afterwards, who's a roommate in their same kind of, I guess, big room, dorm-ish. It's similar, like, in the Wink Saga, or the Wings Club, where they have one big kind of, like, dorm room, where they have one bed, when they have two beds, and then two beds, and then they just have Stella with her own kind of big, grandioso bed room. And anyways, we get to see the other one as Tara, who has another roommate with Musa. And they kind of have drama for the, because they don't necessarily understand each other. Because, you know, they're roommates for the first time. And that's kind of a common occurrence when you're roommates with people for the first time. We then get to see a fight with what are known as specialists. Whatever that means. As they talk a little bit about the lore of the Burned Ones. With a weird exposition dump kind of thing. We meet Riven, who is Sky's friend. Who seems a little less jerky than Sky, but still seems pretty jerky. Because everyone must be a jerk. Who then finds the dead shepherd. Oh wait, I called it. He's a dead shepherd. Teachers then talk about how they haven't seen a burned one in, 15, in about 16 years, and we have established that Bloom is 16 years old. There is no coincidence there, in the slightest. We then get to see that this uh, school is holding a party for these new students, where we meet Beatrix, who decides to skip the party to go try to meet the headmistress. And the assistant, rightly, um, talks to Beatrix and says, yeah, you don't just make your appointments with the headmistress without actually making an appointment. And she just goes in anyways because apparently she can do that and got really no kickback from it. And in the middle of this, we have a, see a flashback with Bloom fighting over with her mother, telling her that she needs to be more social, which is kind of, I mean, is kind of a bit of a criticism, but at the same time, it's kind of weird to have that big of an argument over just, are you social or not? We go back to Bloom, who's now at the staring at the party. She's asked Sky where she can go to be alone, so she can go outside. Sky is still a jerk and a creeper. <laughs> Stella and Sky then have a scene. Bloom decides to try to practice her magic when everything goes wrong, and again, Aisha saves her. So in just the first episode, you see Aisha save Bloom like twice. That's that's supposed to be Stella's goal. Anyway. They decide to bond with it, which is lucky, and Bloom then explains that her parents took her door off, and because of that, she got angry at them, and almost burned her mother to death when she discovered that she had magical powers. Okay, okay. I almost called this one. When Bloom said she wanted control near the beginning, I thought, oh no, she had killed her parents. I mean, I was happily wrong about that, but I was right, she did do something uh, huge and bad with her powers. And that was almost murder. Called it, called it, called it. Alrighty, alrighty. Give me this back. <clears throat> back to the, the plot, or at least kind of what we saw from the first episode. Aisha discusses more with Bloom about her past and finds out that because uh, the baby that Bloom's mother originally had was dead as soon as she was basically out and then instantly recovered. She assumed that Bloom was supposed to be a changeling and not like some human with magical powers. Bloom, you know, kind of freaks out about this. This is some new information for her. She just thought that she was from like some dismantled dead bloodline according to the headmistress. So she kind of just like runs off. We then get to go see Riven, who's the less jerky of the two, become more of a jerk as he bullies one of the new, new first-year boys into drinking alcohol and tries to force him on it. Luckily, one of the roommates, Tara, is against bullying and decides to stand up and then, instead of punching him in the face, decides to use the trees to almost choke him to death. Because that's a better alternative, I suppose. I just don't think it's very satisfying, to be honest. Stella then gives Bloom a dimension hopping ring who, if you know, is kind of like a family heirloom in her bloodline. And I'm just going to say this is kind of a dumb thing, but I'll talk about this later. And um, she gives it to Bloom to go to Earth 
as a way of basically helping her get over the whole she's a changeling thing. And we get to see the monster from earlier. The burned one, so to speak. And <clears throat> Bloom goes to her house, then calls her parents right outside her house just to talk to them, and she's kind of sad and homesick. And she can't really tell them about any of the magic powers or anything she's learned about, so it's kind of a weird kind of talking scene, but at the same time, it's pretty emotional. She then goes back to the warehouse and then gets attacked by the monster that followed her into the portal because she's apparently dumb enough to not close a portal after you enter from a magical world. I don't know. I feel like that should be, like, the top ten things you should learn about when using portals. Luckily, the roommates decide to come to check on Bloom after she gets attacked and talked about talk to the headmistress, who then goes and saves her. Aren't roommates great? Stella went to go see Skye because she felt guilty about giving Bloom the ring to go to Earth. Apparently, she might have also been planning the hope that Bloom might have been attacked by the burned one and then killed by it. But that also makes me wonder why would she give her the ring in the first place, because then that would give the... Anyways, that's just a dumb tangent. We get to go back to Beatrix. Um, she's kind of still being a weirdo again, just going around and trying to go towards the headmistress. Tara and Musa have a makeup scene, which is pretty nice, actually. We get to see that the headmistress chained it up because she wants to study this burned one after saving Bloom from it. She thinks that it could be even connected to Bloom and wants to read its mind. Beatrix visits the burned monster and then tortures it on screen for whatever reason. I'm sure there's a reason for it. I just don't see it. Anyways, that's kind of all we see in the first episode. There's actually a lot that goes in in there. So, yeah, if you want to see all of this happen and actually make understanding of it, it requires you to actually continue with the series, I'm assuming. Let's go on to the pacing of this. Okay. Pacing and story. Well, first off, there's a lot more plot in the Netflix one because it's like an hour while the cartoon is like 20 minutes. We probably should have watched the first two episodes of the cartoon for a better and more fair comparison. But what you're gonna do? Hindsight is 2020. 2021. <laughs> that joke will age very well in the future. Okay. The pacing I felt was actually pretty consistent throughout the Netflix one. Things happen, and then it has a rise in action at the climax, a cooldown period, and a hook for the next installment. It's like a lot of things. The pacing is competent. It doesn't break the mold, but it doesn't really need to. However, the scene at the end was really freaking dumb. Beatrix's face was hidden uh, while she was going to go where the burned one was kept. So they were treating it like it's going to be a big reveal. But then, surprise, surprise, the creepy, evil-seeming girl is actually evil. Like, Wow! Shocker! I am blown away by this amazing twist. My only big down, I guess really bad fads about the pacing is starting Bloom off instantly in the school. We kind of don't get a lot of the story, and it makes the first ten minutes kind of jarring. They kind of throw you in without any, like, understanding or anything, and even Bloom has more information than you do, and that's saying a lot in this series. Bloom's not supposed to. But she seems to have a lot more knowledge about how the world works and has no reasoning for why. And she already, as we can see, knows Stella and all these different people that she's meeting. It seems almost like the first time. At the same time, it feels like she doesn't. It's kind of a weird mix, and it just makes the first ten minutes pacing-wise a lot less consistent. Even though the rest of that episode is extremely consistent in story pacing. It's just that one char those character moments are just kind of funky in the beginning. I guess they could have started with maybe Dowling, Bloom, and her parents arranging for Bloom to go to the school, but um, maybe they just wanted to have the setup for the dead guy. Because we gotta have setup for the dead guy and monster, I guess. This episode does honestly quite a bit of work to set up things for later in both story threads and world building details. 
I I appreciate that. I do wish we got more time to just be in this world and have some fun. But that's my personal preference. And I get that's not necessarily a story need. Some of these plot threads are indeed interesting as well. Like Bloom being a changeling. And the burned ones disappearing around the same time she was fo she was born. Other plot threads are terrible. Like Stella, Sky, and Bloom being in a love triangle. Before Bloom even gets to know Sky. It's boring. Stella and Sky are broken up. Then Sky shows interest in Bloom. And Bloom says maybe later she'll hang out with Sky. And Stella immediately wants to get back together with Sky again. It's shallow doesn't make me care about them other than Bloom being the ma and like I don't care about the couple and I don't get why the show wants us to care about them other than Bloom being the main character and therefore should be getting the guy or but honestly this whole plot point should get the guillotine and it doesn't help that Stella and Sky are kind of terrible but I'll we'll get more into that when we get to characters later like I said I feel Overall, it feels like a YA novel. It's not as great as The Hunger Games or as bad as Twilight, but it's a thing. Hey, 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 hey. I actually like Twilight. Besides, you can't criticize. You haven't even read the book. It's a bit hard to get through a book that's that trite. Like, it's so vapid with Bella's whining. Eh, I'm judging it. And just be glad I watched the movies with you. I love you, baby. Talking about, like, one chapter of the book and judging the whole thing based on that. <sighs> I love you, too. But yes, I agree that this series feels a lot like a YA novel. As I mentioned before, the beginning just doesn't feel natural. You kind of get thrown in in some weird pacing issues. And I honestly probably wouldn't be as inclined to think that it was this bad as pacing in the beginning if the next 40 minutes of this wasn't so better paced. Like, if it was, if it follows this was just really ridiculously pacing but also really fun, I'd be fine with it. But because it, it had, like, much better potential based on what we saw later after the 10 minutes, it's just... Uh, anyways, yeah, the first 10 minutes feel like a really bad YA, like, fan fiction novel. And then... The next 40 minutes feels like a more competent YA novel that's actually, like, on the shelves. I mean, yes, it still has some forced stuff. Like, for example, I really hate it when they make characters that just do dumb things for just the sake of creating conflicts. Uh, just to give you some of the examples, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but Stella gave her, like, family heirloom to Bloom. Even though they kind of already say that Bloom and Stella don't really have much of a relationship, they just kind of know each other, and that's it. And she still trusts her with this family heirloom that she doesn't, like, shouldn't want to have lost. And sure, maybe we do have some Bloom encounter with Stella beforehand that maybe made her have more trust, but we don't see that within how these two react with each other. And her giving her the ring and then having no, like, return policy, because, again, she just feels like Bloom wants to go home. Like, doesn't want to stay at the school. So was she thinking of going to get the ring back? Like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like I said, like, uh, you said earlier, uh, I think Stella might have been trying to hoping to, for Bloom to get kind of hurt by going outside the barrier to use that stupid ring. But then she would still lose the ring! I just don't get it. You don't have to get it. It's forced drama. And I take it back, that ring is actually really freaking cool. I want it. Another example, I feel like this is one that I picked up instantly, but Bloom opens the portal and then leaves the door open, then walks out the door of the warehouse, then closes the door of the warehouse and locks it, and is just like, you know better than this than to keep the portal door open and keep it unlocked, especially when they've already had the notices of the burned ones going through. And also, especially when Stella knows and is probably going to be easily mentioned. But yet they have to show the drama of her leaving the door open and yet closing the warehouse door. It just doesn't feel natural. It feels like a dumb character art thing that they did to force character dumbness. And that's just that's just a bit of my issues with some of their 
interactions, but it's a big thing that happens in a lot of, like, incompetent YA novels, and even some competent ones. You'll notice where the characters are just dumb for the sake of being dumb. Like, there's no actual character that should do that. Okay, I think we've exhausted the story and pacing. Let's go on to characters. Okay, I have to ask. Why do so many people think more mature or more serious or more grounded or more realistic or whatever equals to people being mean to each other? Especially with characters. Honestly, yeah, they just made all these characters accentuated jerks. They don't really make them actual characters as much as they're just jerks. I'm not sure I totally agree with that because Tara and Aisha are amazing, but we'll get to that later. Okay. Let's start with the worst characters and work our way up to the amazing ones. Stella is a bit... Mm, she's the worst. She's just the worst. Like, she still loves fashion, but she's so much more shallow and jerky. She's basically a mean girl, and not a fun one like Regina George. You know, for mean girls, people still talk about that, right? I'm not that out of the loop. Sorry. Off topic. Uh, she says she's a mentor, not a tutor, just to get out of helping the girls, and acts like she has thinly veiled contempt for everyone. She's jealous of a guy she broke up with, and then gets back together with him before Bloom can go on a date with him. Also, considering Musa said, said Stella had guilt over sending Bloom to, uh, go outside the bear to use that, you know, magic ring thing. I'm pretty sure Stella actually tried to murder Bloom, which is great for characters. Th right? We want our characters to be attempted murderers. That's what uh, high schoolers and college age kids do. Try to murder each other, right? Lord of the Flies, I guess. But then Sky says she Stella's better than she thinks she is. She better be, honestly. Because right now, she's dragging down the whole show. And uh, what more can I say than she's just the worst? I have to add to that is I just don't understand Stella as a character in this. I feel, honestly, that they looked at kind of an overview of the personalities and saw that fashion and just took her entire character based on that with other live action characters who thought of more about fashion than anything else. They didn't actually see anything else past the fashion. And that's part of the reason why she's kind of the worst. Because she's such like a one note character and that's nothing like the Stella that we see in even the first episode of The Winx Club. <clears throat> Which is saying a lot because there's not a lot of time with Stella in the first episode of The Winx Show. Because it's a 20 minute episode and she's there for like five minutes of it. <clears throat> oh, she was there for more than five minutes, and you know it. But let's go into the second worst character, Sky. <sighs> he goes up and starts messing around with the lost new girl. And that's supposed to be charming, I guess. Then when he finds out that she's actually from California and has no idea how magic works, he's suddenly super nice. Why weren't you nice to the person who was clearly lost at the beginning? And then he's friends with Riven, who's also a jerk, and dates Ste and he also dates Stella. So I guess this version of Sky has no taste. Less importantly, what is he? He says Bloom must be a fairy, which, no duh, she's going to a fairy school. But what does that make him then? Like, I know they call him a specialist, but what does that mean? That line, like, when he says that, that implies he's not a fairy and can't do magic. Okay, I admit that's not actually a point against the character. It's just a thing that grieves me, and I'll probably bring it up multiple times, because I know how to beat a dead horse. Sky is basically, like, the carbon copy of Stella, in the sense that they're one-note characters. They probably were perfect for each other, I'm sure, at the time they were together. I really hope that we see more of them, in the sense of them growing more so than actually of how they are now. Sky 
just wants to be a jerk for the sake of being a jerk. And then even when he is trying to be nice, he still seems like he's a jerk. I guess the next worst character, in my opinion, is Riven. Like, he bullied that first year into making him drink. I really wanted Terra to punch him, Hermione style. But I guess, you know, Plant Chopes is a close second. And there's not much to him. He's just kind of jerky, quippy, and sulky. I mean, he'll probably get more deaths later, but he's just a jerk. What more is there to say? There really isn't much more to say. I just want to add that I have a big tangent of <clears throat> all the big prominent guys in this show are kind of just jerks. <clears throat> and none of the guys that we get to see, except for the one first year that we barely see, even feel like characters in a sense. They're kind of like that whole high school cliche writing where you have the guys who are like in football always be this big high school bully cliche that just bullies people for the sake of being bullying and feeling superior. But when we do it like that, it doesn't really enforce good character. All it does is just enforce <clears throat> characters that are just unlikable. We want a way that will enforce characters to be intelligent and relatable, but these aren't them. And then I guess we have Dowling. She's the stern, but kind of nice teacher. I don't really care so much for her so far, but you know, she was less of a focus this episode. She'll probably get more focus down the line. And I hope uh, we'll do some more interesting things with her and all the secrets she's keeping. And I'm just happy that she didn't give Beatrix the time of day for Beatrix just being there and trying to force her way on her doorstep. But otherwise, yeah, she's not really much to be talked about. And then we have Training Guy. I think his name was Silver. He was just kind of basic, and I don't really care for him for now. But like I said, the adults really don't get much focus this episode. Hopefully, he'll do more interesting things later on. I mean, to be fair, all he was in this episode was just the exposition dump for the Burned Ones. It wasn't a bad exposition dump by any means. It wasn't like the big first exposition dump we had with Sky, but an exposition dump nonetheless. Okay, I guess Beatrix is the next one on the list. Honestly, we probably should have put her lower. Like, she's just kind of there and is creepy, arrogant, and oh, so edgy. And big shocker, when we find out she's evil, I am so shocked. I am more shocked than you'll ever believe. And because she's based on the tricks, you know, the three evil witches from the cartoon, they called her Beatrix. Because tricks, tricks, tricks. So clever. How is this more trite than the cartoon? Come on, the cartoon named the character who had music for their power as Musa. It's just about as trite. Point taken. Beatrix just seemed like she was just being the forward individual who just wanted to be evil. I don't think that they really thought too much in how to make her, I don't know, interesting? She was okay. I think that's why she's more in the middle-ish of this list. I think that I'd still probably take Silva better. I like the exposition dump he gave. <clears throat> <sighs> First, I love Bloom's parents, and which is, but then we found out that the mom was terrible. They would have been higher on the list if the mom hadn't been terrible. Like, she constantly criticized Bloom for not being more social. Like, it would be one thing if Bloom was on the internet all day and her mom wanted her to get outside a little, but Bloom regularly went to antique shops and fixes antiques, which is a really freaking cool hobby. And the mom could just easily encourage Bloom to join an antique club or something that fits with her interests or invite Bloom with her to go to events. But no, Bloom has to be social the mother's way. Then when, uh, then the mom gets mad at Bloom when Bloom talks back to her and slams her door in her mom's face. Like, maybe if you aren't being a jerk to your daughter, Bloom wouldn't be slamming doors in your face. 
Uma isn't doing anything dangerous or illegal in her room. She's just hiding from you. So taking her door away is ridiculous. And the dad's just kind of there. He's nice, but he sides with the mom. It's kind of sad because we see the cartoon version of these guys have so much character and depth just in the sense that we have the strict and then the one who's very extremely forward with also enforcing Bloom as a character to grow. We don't really see any of that in these two. The mom is basically just there to be almost like an obstacle in her way. The mom only wants to make sure that she's trying to be social but does it in the worst ways possible. I mean, have you heard of anyone pulling off someone's door and getting rid of it just because they weren't social enough with people? I've seen people get their doors taken off for other things, for doing things like, I don't know, illegal in private spaces. But that just seems like something that's so dumb. Yeah, and it's a bit of a disappointment since Bloom and her parents got along so well in the cartoon. Anyway, let's move on to a better character. This... First year boy. I forget his name, but he was really cute and he did make an impression on me. Like, he doesn't have much character so far, but he and Tara were fun together, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of him. We finally have a guy that's nice, Scott. You happy? Yes, I am happy that we have a guy character who's nice. I mean, he's kind of also, though, fits in the weird thing of being the guy who's just too passive, so he'll do whatever anyone tells him to do, even though he is nice. <clears throat> He's also trying to do things the higher-ups want him to do because he wants to feel accomplished or some sense of vibrato from them. Um, I do, though, like at least the chemistry that we see with him and Tara. They seem like they actually can get along, and he does have an interest in her hobbies, and they actually talk about things that are interesting to each other rather than one of them trying to overplay the other. That is true, though. I think you're referencing the second episode a bit soon, babe. Yes, we watched ahead. I was curious. Okay, let's move on to the next best character in this episode. As in the first episode. Musa. She's a bit of a jerk ignoring people, especially Tara, but I also kind of relate to her. Like... I, too, get overwhelmed by some people and ignore them with my headphones. And it also makes sense that she gets overwhelmed since she has empath powers, which she explains uh, towards the end of this episode. Like, she could be dealing with it better, but I'm also going to get her some slack because that's a tough thing to deal with, with being constantly washed over with so many contradicting uh, feelings and sounds. Huh, I wonder if that's a metaphor for autism or something. Or some sort of uh, perception sensitivity. But I might just be reading too much into it. I'm not an expert in those sorts of things. I mean, I th I kind of figured almost that Muse was going to be at least either a mind magic person or an empath. Just based on <clears throat> her reactions with Tara and then just seeing her. Because it definitely feels like she could see more than she was letting on with Tara. And that might have been the reason why she was a bit of a jerk with her. <clears throat> but I think it's also due to her just being extremely vulnerable in the state of with her music. So that she just kind of wants to not talk with people. Overall, I think that Musa, as just a first episode character, can give you a lot to think about. And it gives you a little more interesting insight to see where it would take her because we don't get to see a lot out of Musa in this episode, as much as we just learn of her empath as an ability. Okay, Bloom gets put in towards the middle, which is kind of sad for a main character, but that's less her and more how great Aisha and Tara are. Like, Bloom is definitely the most dynamic of all the characters in terms of acting, which really makes her stand out, other than just her accent. I mean, it makes sense since she's the main character and we want to be kind of drawn towards her. And this is one way of doing it. And her uh, acting being a little more emotional and dramatic also kind of makes her feel a bit more, I don't know, American? I mean, the actress is already one of the few Americans in a largely British cache. But they could have directed her to be more reserved. But then I feel we would have lost a reason for making her American in the first place, other than the weird need that Americans seem to have to have an American in a story to care about it, but 
that's my own personal side rant. Like, it, having her be American really does kind of make her pop and feel foreign and feel a bit emotionally unstable against all these people who are a bit more reserved in their mannerisms and act a bit more similar. I do also relate to Bloom as I too am a little bit more of an introvert and would be would rather be doing my hobbies and then hanging out at parties except for I kind of wish I could be more social right now but that's coronavirus and hopefully if you're watching this in the future we've gotten over that oh dear lord I've ho I hope we've gotten over that but with Bloom I'm also a bit over how she's super duper special okay this isn't totally fair, because it's not really Bloom's fault, or even most of the stuff that happens around her. A lot of the stuff around her makes me intrigued, and want to know more about the mystery of what's going on. It's just the way Bloom's mother talks about her in this first episode. I knew you were more special than anyone, and would walk past different than me or your father's. Like, come on, I know she was a miracle baby to you guys, but... You, as far as you know, she's not freaking magic or the second coming. You don't need to talk about your child like she's going to change the world. <sighs> this is a YA novel movie. Every individual single main character has to be the special chosen one. That's the criteria on the YA novel list. We went over this before. Not on the channel specifically, but Mr. Stray and I have talked about the YA novel lists. Maybe we'll discuss that with this channel later on. But anyways, I do really like that they show a lot of Bloom as a vulnerable individual. We see a lot of her issues with her mother, mainly her mother. Her and her dad don't really have problems, but they also don't really get along. It's kind of a weird relationship there. <clears throat> but we all also get to see another big reasoning of why she's here is also that she doesn't really hurt her parents. She still cares for her mother, even if she doesn't really you know, get along with her. And so she doesn't want to hurt her, either it be purposefully or impurposefully. And so she wants to go to the school to really learn her powers so she can not hurt people when she doesn't want to hurt them. And I think that's a big pro, I think, in this case, because we see a lot of Bloom wanting to learn more to be able to learn more about herself, but also so that she doesn't necessarily do another, I'm going to hurt someone. And we also see that her life isn't really in the best of spaces, because whenever she tries to get into a hobby, her mother quickly will stop it or do something that could harm her on it. But overall, I do really like this version of Bloom just for that. Because we actually get to see a lot more reasoning and character and depth in her own space in this story. But yeah, this is also just YA novel stuff again, over and over again. I said it's a competent YA novel, though. Okay, let's move on to the second best character, Tara. Tara is Flora's cousin and replacement. On one hand, Flora better show up and not be whitewashed. On the other hand, I do actually like Tara. She likes plants, is friendly, talkative, perceptive, insecure, and nervous. She has a little bit of that nice fat girl side friend, but the show is self-aware and lets her get one over on the bullies, which is great. She sure punched Riven, though. Like, the choke was fine, but punch him, punch him, punch him. Am I? I might be a little violent. Okay. But it was great. And I do kind of relate to Tara, too. In the sense that I sometimes always share and I'm a in, bit insecure about doing well. Or how people perceive me. I was a, more insecure in high school. Uh, especially about my friends, namely that they wanted to hang out with each other, but not me. And yes, that was indeed justified. When I saw them doing that on the same day, they said, oh, we just want to eat alone today. But they were talking to other people without me. I still have trauma. So much trauma. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that, baby. <clears throat> Anyways... Tara is a good character overall. Yes, they do fall in the weird um, fat girlfriend nice trope. 
<clears throat> kind of deal, but Terra also has more than that with her actually having a hobby and her entire personification not being I am fat. But she's also actually really nice and is interested in the people and getting to know them, and I, and we get to hear a lot more about her just relationship with trying to be a big part of this school because she's pretty much lived here this whole her whole life, practically. Okay, time to talk about best girl, Aisha. Ha. Gosh, I wish I could be her. She's athletic, friendly, and is kind, but calls people out and is really competent. She totally saves Bloom several times in just one episode and thinks on her feet. She's just kind of great, and I really enjoyed her and Bloom interacting. I don't know what else I can say except she's best girl. She should be your waifu. I mean, I should also be your waifu, but... I'm also married, so a little hard to get in that competition. It's okay, you can be my waifu. <laughs> but I agree, Aisha is the best character. Um, uh, going on, it's also why a novel trope to have the best character save the main character a number of times in the beginning to show that they, these two are going to be the main two characters that they're going to focus on. So, again, why a novel compensation with all that. But... I really do like Aisha, and she's not super OP in her sense. I mean, I'm sure we may see more OP moments with any of these characters, but I really do like Aisha's also acting and her really her interaction with chemistry with Bloom. She general she genuinely likes Bloom. She genuinely wants to help Bloom, and she genuinely feels like Bloom needs some aid, which, as we see, she definitely does. She needs a lot more information and knowledge about what the heck is going on in this world. So overall, Aisha is the best character, and you can't really stop that from being an actual fact from the first episode. So here's the question. Should Aisha have been the main character? <laughs> nah, we need someone to actually grow. What, Aisha is too perfect for you? So far. I mean, she is, but... <laughs> okay, I guess the next topic we should go over is world building. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of things that they cover in this show and a lot of things that are clearly set up to be explained later. For example, they keep calling Earth the first world, and they don't explain why. But considering first tends to mean important, especially in this kind of stuff, I expect it will have significance later, and if it doesn't, I'll be kind of disappointed. You know? Well, I do appreciate that the show isn't info do dumping a lot of the time. I still want more explanations for certain things. Like when Skye tells Bloom that she must be a fairy and implies that he's not. I still want to know what the heck that means he is. Is he just a regular human in the magic world? But why is he attending a fairy school? I know they had that whole training montage area thing. But, like, why is that also at the magic school? Is it just because the school is big and they figured, you know what, let's put all the stuff together? Heh. <laughs> In the cartoon, they kind of did this better. They explained that there were different schools for different kinds of magic people. And the guys had their own training school. Yes, yes, I know I'm bringing in stuff from later episodes, but the four kids actually went over this earlier, so I, it still works. But like I was saying, he's still attending this school with Bloom in the Netflix one, so like, what's the difference? Can I get a little grounding here? What about that old shepherd guy who was killed in the beginning? When he crossed the barrier, was he a fairy or an old specialist? Or a random human who was somehow in the magic dimension? Also, for a freaking magic dimension, there are, it's a lot less magical than I thought it would be. Like, they have regular tech, which I guess is kind of okay. It opens up possibilities and we're kind of in a tech-obsessed world. But then we have things like people still needing to gather firewood 
in a world full of magic. And it's just like, really? You don't have something for this? It's kind of lame. Like, I don't expect them to have full-on moving staircases like the Harry Potter movies got. But I expected something. A, maybe a, just a little bit more? I mean, we did get the magic special effects when people showed off their powers, but can we have some more magic in this world to make it feel a bit wondrous and not just dark and gloomy with one monster running around? Ha. <sighs> On a less important note, the... Okay, Aisha mentions that she went to school and destroyed the plumbing. Does this mean the magic dimension has a school system like America or the UK and that plumbing is a multi-dimensional concept? Or did they just take that from the regular world? Are the fairies constantly raiding the human world for ideas like plumbing or Harry Potter? Hey, I mean, even fairies need to go potty somewhere. Plus, I mean, as we can tell from this cast, it seems like they're all butts, so making potty humor just seems right up there kind of alley. Hard D hard. That, that was a bad joke. <sighs> like I was saying, I don't need to be given every detail about this world, especially in the first episode, but I wanted a bit more grounding. Maybe that was enough for you guys at home, and maybe I just need too much spoon-fed to me, but eh, I wanted more. I also felt like the whole power equals emotion thing has been kind of done before and done to death. I mean, it's still a good idea, and, and I don't hate it, it just hasn't brought anything new to the table. Maybe it will later on. But that's a lot of the show. Maybe they'll do something later on. How'd you like the world building, Sith Scott? Thank you for the Sith part. And I'm looking at my notes, and all it says here is S-J-G-F-J-K-L-D. So I'll do what I can with that. But, ultimately, I really did like the world building, at least, in the sense that it gave a lot of depth to what could be a possibility. But yeah, it definitely feels, at the same time, like they just took a lot of the stuff that we have now and tried to make it like that was magic when in reality it's just more technology which is kind of sad because we don't see the technology fairy in this so she'd be a prime thing in this series apparently that they just got rid of no techno yet there is technology but overall in terms of how this world gets established and how the pacing goes from it I really enjoy how they actually go through it and focus on various elements that I'm guessing are probably going to come up later in the series. The whole first world part, I'm assuming more at the fairies. I doubt they'll do too much of specialists because I have no idea what that's supposed to be about. But that's just my thoughts. Oh, fairy wings. I forgot the freaking fairy wings. Okay. Earlier, they mentioned that fairies used to have wings, but they lost the magic or spell or whatever ability for it. So, later on, there better be fairy wings showing up in this, especially since the logo is a freaking pair of wings. They're fairies. Give them wings. Wings or we riot. Let's not talk about riots right now, and let's actually talk more about what the dialogue's like here. Wow, smooth transition, baby. Smooth as butter. I, again, you remind me why I love you. Am I too sappy? I don't know. What's the butter got to do with it? Pshhh. Okay, hopping off of Sith Scott's smooth transition. For the most part, the dialogue is fine. But there are some standout bad lines. Like earlier we mentioned Bloom and her mother had a fight. And in this fight is my favorite bad line. Bloom and her mom are yelling at each other about, you know, Bloom not being social and stuff. And Bloom's mom straight up calls her a weird loner. To which Bloom retorts, you called your daughter a weird loner. Take a parenting class. So, I guess the people behind the show 
know that was a dumb line for a parent to say to their kid, and they still kept it in. Classic. Sheer perfection of bad lines. Then we also have just the cringy bad lines, like one of mine is from Sky, where Bloom is going outside, and Sky is worried because a guy, you know, just kind of died. And then Bloom is then talking to him, and then Sky gets worried about mansplaining. Because that totally comes up when you're talking about people dying. I think he was worried of over-explaining that a guy died, but I don't think you should be, because a guy freaking died. That That's not mansplaining to say, don't go out, someone died. That, uh, it was... It was not a great line, and not really nearly as fun as you called your daughter a weirdo loader. <laughs> huh. Okay, and there was this great exchange between Bloom and Aisha when they were first setting up, and they were just kind of bonding, and Aisha started talking about Harry Potter, and it was really fun and natural and a great bonding moment. I just kind of like the little dialogue bit there. Or maybe I just like the scene. Eh, splitting hairs on what we're talking about. We also noted that shortly after that, that Tara was, had to be a Ravenclaw because of all the book, book smarts she had to have. True, true. Tara is totally a Ravenclaw or a Hufflepuff. It's a hard choice because she's so sweet, but she also, like, Knows a ton of plants. Though I do have a bone to pick with a certain line. Bloom says she's the total opposite of a cheerleader, whatever that is. I mean, I guess the delivery makes it sound naturalistic enough, but I know I've known cheerleaders in high school, and you're not the opposite of them. Like, I was friends with this one specific cheerleader. She wore glasses, loved reading the Hunter Hunger Games, kept trying to sneak our one mutual friend out to go see the movie. Like, she was definitely more social than me, but she wasn't super extroverted. And can we stop acting like cheerleaders are all, all these pretty, popular, rich, snobby girls? Some of them are impossible. I am great at jokes. Laugh, please. Pity laugh, please. <laughs> but, yeah... That goes on along with the whole one-note character kind of stereotype. I thought we were trying to get rid of those nowadays, or at least do them better. Okay, do you want to go over the romance real quick here? Oh, wait, there's romance in this? Oh, that's what that's supposed to be. Yeah, I guess we kind of already covered it with Stella and Sky and Bloom kind of having a love triangle, though it's more between Stella and Sky, and Bloom's just kind of... There, not caring. Well, Stella and Sky have their drama. Did you just give a recap while saying you didn't need to give a recap? I don't know. Maybe. Whatever. Okay, I guess we'll move on to miscellaneous or whatever. Because we've got a few extra notes on the Felix live action that we didn't go over. And don't particularly fit into a comparison or overview. So I want to do this first, just because I think this is quite humorous, but um, when you look at the rating on this on Netflix, it gives it a TV mature rating. No, this is the same rating they gave the Witcher series. And the reasoning for this was for language and for instances of smoking tobacco. The very first word out of the guy's mouth we first see on screen is fecking sheep. Fecking. This is mature. Now I just want to see Geralt saying fecking. But then, you know, after that shortly words, we get to see some sh some off some sheep gore. So I suppose that the reason they made this TV mature was so they could show a dead sheep. Man, poor guy. Also, I wasn't too thrilled with the opening song. It felt a little on the nose and not really deserved, but I might be overreading that. But something I do want to make fun of is, like, when the guy gets murdered off screen, there's this blood splat that lands on 
one of the sheeps, and I was just laughing my butt off. I can't explain why, but it was so funny to me that just, pop, covered in blood, and the sheep don't care. Sheep gonna sheep. But one thing that did kind of bug me was that the kids didn't really seem to care other than Sky. Like, and what I mean is that the g old guy died and Riven found him, and no one other than Sky seemed to care. Musa says he was decapitated, and they just start making jokes about it. I think, like, Riven should be a bit more traumatized about finding a dead body, or at least bragging about how cool he is, and the other kids should be kind of terrified. Like, if your high school or college found a dead body, even if it wasn't made official, but the rumors were going around, and you knew the guy who found it, I think you would be a bit more freaked out. I mean, I none of them directly know, except for, no Riven, except for Terra and Sky, but still, I think you would be a bit more freaked out. Maybe that's why Riven, uh, why Sky was worried about Bloom going out when no one else was. He actually knew Riven found it. Okay. And I don't, uh, I don't particularly like the fact that Bloom is now lying to her parents and they're not as close as... Because, like, that... Like, I get it. Sometimes you go through bad things and you don't want people you're close to to see it. Or you don't think they'll react well. Especially with Bloom and his parents. But I've just gotten so sick of the we gotta keep these secrets from all these people we know and trust and then have a liar reveal that I'm just done, especially when the cartoon just had the parents knowing from the get-go. One thing I did kind of enjoy was Bloom was a changeling. Like, I mean, we don't bring that nearly enough up in fantasy or horror. And it's such a fun mythological concept. I mean, I do kind of hate that the unnecessary drama it causes, but overall I kind of enjoy that we're bringing that back, especially in a show about fairies and magic. Okay, Scott, your turn. Honestly, I liked the parents in the first one better just because of that, that they were okay with her going to a magic school. And I was kind of assuming that was going to be the same deal here. Kind of sad that wasn't. And it's kind of sad because it's another YA novel trope thing that I was talking about earlier, where the underdog always lies about where is the going, and then they always decide that they know best. And then it turns out to then blow up in their face, and then problems arise, and then they have this big come to god moment where they actually tell the truth or sometimes they go to tell the truth and then still don't because of their issues and then it goes into a long foreboding thing anyways yeah i just didn't like it okay i also admit i really like stella's ring i want it because dimension hopping is cool and the design might be a bit much but it still looks really pretty and i gotta make fun of this one scene like it was so try hard. Like, I was never one of the cool kids or did drugs. But, like, Beatrix and Riven share smoke? Like, wouldn't you just want the blunt if you want the drugs? Like, what is up with that? Like, that that's just so try hard to be edgy and cool that it just comes off as silly and funny to me. Also, Oh, there's another great scene where uh, Tara and Musa are bonding and Musa's explaining that it's a bit hard for her to share her emotions. And she says to Tara, if you really want to know how I feel, listen to this. And then it just plays wordless, somber indie music. At least I'm pretty sure it was wordless. So Musa feels indie music. You, uh, you do realize that Music is not a, a universal language like we say it is, but if you listen to, like, traditional music from other countries, you'll probably mistake the mood. Like, my one of my psychology teachers played us a traditional Japanese song, and we all thought it sounded sad. No, it was just a happy song. Like, it was a traditional happy song, and we were just like, oh, it's somber and sad. No. It was not in the slightest. Okay. 
Any other miscellaneous things you want to talk about, baby? I do want to talk a little bit about one of the things that I really liked, at least in the, what we saw in the first episode, was they had some pretty decent choreographi- choreographed fights with all their so-called specialists and showing their skill. And I thought it was really well done, and it was actually um, filmed really well. The cinematography of just the fighting was really well done. It didn't have very big jumps or cuts in it. And I just wanted to give them some kudos for that. Okay, fair. Though we can probably do a comparison between how the two episodes do their fight scenes a little later. Okay. Oh, speaking of comparison, I think the next section is comparison and overview. And anything else we forgot. Okay, babe, you want to go first? I'm trying to draw a plank here, but I don't think we, I forgot anything too much. But I would say my final thoughts is I am impressed by the level of quality the Netflix one tried to put in, even if the quality wasn't in necessarily the story of parts or even trying to look at the source material. But overall, I find it impressive with the cinematography, with the action, and with just the pacing of it. Okay, but would you call it a recommendation or a wreckage? It's really hard to base a series based on its first episode, I'll tell you that much. But if they keep the same consistency and quality of the Netflix one with its pacing of the last 40 minutes of the first episode, I would say then I would say it's a recommendation, a recommended watch just because it's pretty well done in just those regards and that it'll keep your attention. Um, the animated one, I would say, is also worth your thoughts just if you are interested in watching a bunch of fashionistas saving the world with magics, magic and wings and being fairies and having just fun drama. You know, the drama that's actually fun, not the Netflix forced drama. I think that's the probably the biggest issue with the Netflix one is it has a lot of forced drama in it. As opposed to the cartoon one where it does have drama, but it is so over the field dramatize that it's just more fun and pure joy this one is a bit mixed for me because like you said it is the first episode of both of them so it's kind of hard to give a straight up recommendation or wreckage but I do think the nicked up would probably be more appealing to those who wanted a show to just chill out to and the four kids for those who wanted I don't know, something that's a bit more like a low-key abridged series. And the Netflix would probably be good for those who like YA novels and Riverdale. But that's also, you know, based on the first episode. Okay, but for I do have to say this. During editing, my computer kept crashing at the when I showed the Jelly Donuts clip of Brock, which I hope is still in the final cut. What did... Why? Brock is merely just cursed. Oh, yeah. What did he do to my computer with his cursedness? Cook jelly donuts in it, clearly. Sure, sure. I just think that's about it. You guys can do the clickety-click things and tell us what you thought about the shows and our videos. Should we do more of these first episode verses, or should we just review all of the Netflix show, or review something else, or do we need to fix anything in our videos? Do we make any mistakes? And please try not to torture us with your recommendations. We don't want to have to spend forever on doing things if we don't have to. Oh, you act like we're actually popular or something. But... Yeah, like, if you give us criticism, please be fair and actually t- let us know so we can improve. Thank you for your guys' time. Have a great rest of your day, or night, or afternoon. Bye! Bye!